Welcome to the Mother May I Podcast with Frank and Irene on Strong Island Entertainment. Gee, I hope I didn't make a mistake with these two. They promised me they'd bring in some really good guests. Well, anyway, here's Frank and Irene. Hello and welcome to Mother May I Podcast with Mr. Frank Conniff. I'm Irene Brennis. Frank, how are you? I'm okay. How about you? I'm doing good. I'm a little tired because, um, you know, I just, I couldn't sleep last night. I had insomnia. I just, uh, so I feel a little wrecked uh, today. Uh, you should call me when you're like that. I'm always up really late. Oh, really? Frank, don't, are you serious? I mean, actually, I like the idea of me calling you if I have insomnia. I'm always, I'm always up in the middle of the night. You can call me at 3 a.m. and and, you know... I'll stop. I'll turn the porn off for a minute. and oh. uh, you know. <laughs> I don't want to interrupt those intimate moments with yourself, Frank. I really don't yeah. want to. But I will call you next time because I felt like, uh, okay, so I couldn't sleep. And, um, and Frank, you, you gave some good advice off the, before we started the show. Your advice to me was if somebody has insomnia. Because I've, my whole life, I've never... I st I've stayed up late my whole life, like since I was a kid. When I was a kid, I I had to watch The Tonight Show, you know, um, and then I had to watch The Joe Franklin Show after that. Um, <laughs> that was more important to me to, than school. And I'm not saying that's a good thing. I'm just saying that yeah. was the case with me. And um, I've, I've always loved being up really late at night I, for, for my whole life to this day. Um, it, it's, it's the way I, it, 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 unless I have a, uh, a job, which, you know, I, luckily I, I do have, you know, um, a, my own thing going on. That's a job, but what I mean, but, but of like going into an office, which I don't have to do anymore. Yeah. I, like when I worked on the Kamal Bell show, like that, that was a daily show. That's that day started at eight 30 in the morning, you know, oh, I mean, God. I had to get up for that. Um, uh, but you know what? I always like uh, got up in enough time to walk to work, actually, even even at that early wow. time in the morning. And then that's and then, crazy. Yeah, I can't even because you're really not a morning person. But first of all, I remember being a kid, too, Frank. And one of the, the, the fondest memories of being a child was staying up late. I loved staying up late. Same yeah. thing. Wanted to watch the Tonight Show. Wanted to be like that cool kid staying up. Now, for some reason, I I like staying up late. It's the waking up in the morning and have to, you know, like having to uh, just be well, lucid. You have things you need to do, it, like yeah. you train people, and you might have an right. early appointment or something like that. Um, I, um, you know, I I have my own schedule, so. I've scheduled it. You're so. your own boss, Mr. I Conniff. Know, I, do, I do all my writing at night, you know, and uh, and uh, that, that's although although this morning I got up at eight a.m. because uh, my uh, my my housekeeper comes on Thursdays, and, and she. Frank, I've never seen you so happy. Every Thursday, you're just glowing. You're <laughs> beaming it's my because you have the housekeeper. <laughs> And it's like reflecting off your skin. It's crazy. I see how my happy you are. Is, my apartment is immaculate and all of the people who never visit me think it's great. But wait a minute. So she doesn't come that early, Frank. Why are you waking up so early? Does, what time oh, does she, she come? Comes at, she comes at nine, you know. Oh my God, Frank. Yeah, so I have to get up at uh, like eight and, you know, take a shower and stuff. And, be, and then I go and I... Uh, and I go for a walk in Central Park, and it's awesome. But um, wow. um, but and, and you know what I it's I don't think I have to get up at eight every morning. But I'm thinking like I should do what I do today every day. I the first thing I should do is go for a walk before I do anything mm -hmm. else, which is I the way so. I do it on, on Thursdays. But uh, usually I just linger and fuck around on the internet and stuff, and then I and then I go uh, you know I go after I eat lunch. You know, then I go for a walk uh, in the afternoon usually. But now, like starting this weekend, it's going to get dark like really early. So now I might have to change some things around in my schedule. Change it because you'll. If you're anything like me, when that 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 clock turns back, now I don't know what happened last year, but I sunk 
into a fucking rabbit hole. I really did. It affected, affected me profoundly last year and the year before. And I'm hoping this year I don't have that same reaction to that clock back just one hour. It's, yeah. it's crazy. People but um, like really say that it's about time that we get rid of that whole thing. And as John Fugelsang has pointed out, the whole thing was for farmers like 200 right. years ago. You know, right. it, like, it kind of makes no sense uh, anymore. Um, and they don't, have, uh, they don't have daylight savings time in um, Arizona, but they don't have democracy there either. So, it's, uh, <laughs> which is a great segue into yeah. our next uh, topic. Uh, ding dong, the witch is dead, soon to be out of office, thank God. Um, so, uh, are we feeling optimistic about Ooh. the new mayor? We're talking oh, about uh, oh. de Blasio. Who else? That piece of shit. Oh, United well, this Pacific. guy, this new guy, Eric yeah. Adams, who, who I voted for with a complete, complete lack of enthusiasm. But uh, I, Maya Wiley was my candidate in the primary. Um, yeah. but, you didn't uh, vote for Stacey Pressman, Frank. What? You didn't vote for Stacey Pressman? Oh, I, you know what? I love Stacy, but uh, I love Stacy a lot too. And you know what? I didn't, let me tell you this. i I did vote for Eric Adams and I know this is like, but Stacy, I think I'm really proud of her for doing what she did and seeing it through. It's like no small undertaking. Yeah. It's like a Her Herculean undertaking. I love Kudos it when people, her. Uh, uh, do that. You know, there's mm -hmm. a, another friend of mine. He, he actually lives in California now, but Ben Kissel, uh, like four years ago, he ran for uh, Brooklyn, Brooklyn Borough President, you know, which I thought was wow. Awesome. Did you uh, vote for him? I, I don't live in Brooklyn, so you can only oh, right. vote or like, oh, right. I, I don't live in Staten Island, so I wasn't able to help elect the Republican Borough President who was already had to resign because of corruption, the, the guy you just elected in Staten Island. Oh my God, I can't even believe this. I, I know I had to go vote in Staten Island. I always carry mace because I feel like just wearing a mask is a dead giveaway. Because you walk into the polls there and it says, please have your mask on. Not even the poll workers are wearing masks. And I walk in, I'm the only one, me right. and any other black person at the polls with a dead. So it's very clear. Anyway, um, I actually had to Eric, do a benefit. Eric, Adam, Eric Adams, uh, you know, um, I have mixed feelings at best about him and uh, he's very, you know, pro business and stuff. And, you know, mm -hmm. he's, he's, you know, he, he wasn't my first choice, but I'd rather have him than Curtis Sliwa, who. Oh uh, yeah. You mean the, what is it? The, he's the, uh, the guy that, that came up with or created. Uh, angels. The, the yeah. guardian angels. And, yeah, Fighting and, crime and on the said, streets. I'm sorry. Go ahead. The one thing I would have liked about him is he's a crazy cat person. Uh, he lives in a studio apartment and has like 14 cats or something like that. that oh my I like, God. I like that about yeah, him. Yeah, too. But too. He, he, when he voted on Tuesday, he brought one of his cats with him and then they wouldn't let him bring the cat in the polling place and they got in a big argument. And I saw the picture of the, no cat likes being carried around outside in public like that. No, you know, not at all. He, he was yes. really, he was, you know, here I was thinking he was a good cat person and then here he goes exploiting, exploiting. his cat. You know, yep. which I- Exploiting his cat, exactly. Even the one thing I liked about him now, I, I realize is kind of bullshit. Right, exactly. You don't show up with your cat to the pole. Are you kidding me? That's yeah. traumatizing for the or anywhere. cat. Your cat, your cat doesn't want to go anywhere with you. He, no. doesn't, you, he, he, he doesn't want you to carry him around where he has no control um, uh, and is not in charge of everything. I mean, that's just ridiculous. It is ridiculous. Your cat is not a prop, okay? And listen, the guardian um, angels... you know, they, being a prop. Oh. <laughs> Look who's here. Hey, Millie. Oh my gosh, hi Millie. Hi, sweet Millie. Wow, the place really does look clean, Frank. I just got a little bit of a glimpse there. Yeah. Just a little bit of a glimpse there. It's mm -hmm. looking good. It is looking good. So you're right, Frank. I, I'm down with the prop, but I think that uh, uh, Staten Island overwhelmingly voted for uh, him. Um, at the polls. Yeah, the, uh, the only place in New York City that Republicans do well is uh, Staten Island. Right, they're the only uh, 
a New York City borough that went rogue and uh, unanimously almost voted Trump in. So it's always a, a difficult thing. I must say, it was kind of nice doing a show. I had to do like a benefit show for a firefighter thing last yeah. night, um, which I always get very concerned with. Now, you know that uh, Steve is a retired firefighter. I come from the long line of firefighters on that side, but... Um, but it's always like a very scary, like, I'm like, oh my God, how is this going to go? You know, this fireman right. benefit. Anyway, it went, it went pretty well. You know, everybody was, uh, was great. Everybody had a great sense of humor. And it was nice because I didn't have to pay $30 both ways. No, it's like $15 for the Ver Verrazano Bridge, another 15 to come back, and then another at least $10 in gas. What is that? I'm at 30, I'm at $40 for a $20 spot. So that was kind of nice, you know, <laughs> having, a, it's ridiculous. I mean, I don't know what to do, Frank. It's a lot, but, um, but that was exciting. So I did that last night. Um, and then I got a, pr a procedure on my back. I didn't tell you. I actually oh, had no. like small minor surgery on my back. Wow. What, like, what was yeah. the problem? Well, this is really attractive, okay? And I'm sure you're going to have a full boner after I explain this to you. Hey, I'm pretty I'm sure. Already there, you already so did. <laughs> <laughs> so I had this lump on my back, right? And uh, and I didn't know what it was, but it was very disconcerting. It was really sticking out of the side, out of my back. Very unattractive, really unattractive as well. So I'm very vain, as you know, very vapid bitch. Well, you always but I went to in check and got, out if you have a lump. You got to go check it out. It's got to go check it out. Exactly. So I went and they removed it. I thought, is it going to be malignant? Is it going to be benign? It turned out um, that it was a lipoma, which is just fancy for a fat lump on my back. How's that chubby coming along, Frank? Anyway, so there's, <laughs> there was a fat lump in my back. He removed it. He absolutely yeah. removed it. And then he, he was uh, this doctor, a uh, great doctor. I mean, mm. you know how you, you know how you felt with your heart surgery, right, like right. just going to a great doctor. I mean, this guy, very little pain. It was a local, but then he showed it to me. I don't know why he wanted to show it to me. And I, I, he caught me off guard. He goes, you want to see it? And I'm like, what is he referring to anyway? And then he showed me the jar with the lump in it. And uh, it was quite gross, but anyway, it's out. I got some stitches and I'm on the mend, you know, thank God it wasn't malignant. I'm glad you're okay. And I'm glad it's not something serious. I, I can totally accept just some minor gross thing happening to you. That's fine with me, as long as it's not yeah. a thing. Thank you, Frank. Yeah, so I'm feeling like pretty good. Like, you know, we got this thing out of my back and I'm feeling good. But another thing I never told you, Frank, I don't know why I never told you this. Maybe I didn't want to be an alarmist, but uh, I didn't tell you that a month ago, I actually, no, not a month ago, two months ago. Um, am I ready to say this? Because I didn't really tell anybody, but two months ago, I actually had COVID. You did? I got COVID. Yeah. Wow. I purposely what? didn't tell you. I was waiting for the time to tell you, but I didn't want to tell you because I didn't want to alarm you or for whatever reasons I'm coming out here on this very show to let you know that I actually did get COVID. Um, I think it would have, I mean, the vaccination saved me from having severe COVID. I did get sick, but uh, the vaccination, without a doubt, even on Staten Island, my Staten Island doctor called me up and he said, Irene, the vaccination saved your ass. That's what he said. That's exactly so, what he said. The vaccination so saved your ass. COVID, um, after you've been vaccinated, like what did that feel like? Did it feel like the flu or what, what was that like? Okay, so, um, so I got really sick. I got uh, really bad stomach cramps and I was uh, throwing up uh, like uh, for like five days and I had a really high fever. I think I was running a fever of like 104. I got really, really sick, but I feel like I would have died. And then I had lingering side effects. This was like two months ago. And then I got lingering side effects from it. And I mean, I have no side effects now, but I do feel like I have a little bit of that COVID brain, uh -huh. the fogginess in my brain. But yesterday I was talking to a friend of mine. If anybody uh, was vaccinated and didn't get, get uh, COVID, which of course could happen, but the vaccination is really great because it helps you from landing in the hospital or dying, which is the, the greatest thing about getting the vaccination. Um, if you have the lingering side effects, I was uh, talking to some friends who got the booster and they said that actually completely cleared up any lingering side effects. What, the booster? Yeah. Yeah. Well, have you gotten I'm the COVID. booster yet? 
I haven't gotten it yet because um, I the doctor said I might have antibodies, so there's no rush for me right now, but I am going to get the booster. Okay, and I, I'm, got, I'm actually, I got mine like a few weeks ago. Yeah, and how did you feel? Any side effects from it? I um, No, I, I, I've never felt any side effects from any of the shots. And I know that I've heard other people have, but for whatever reason, um, I think because like, I probably always feel that way, you know, like the way other people always feel like shit when they, when they have <laughs> side effects is how I always feel. So I didn't notice anything. Right. But, uh, but you know what I, I think is, is a good point is that like you took the vaccine and you got COVID and some people will say, oh, that's proof that the vaccines don't work. No, what happened to you is proof that the vaccines do work. Because Absolutely. You got COVID and it sucked ass, but it wasn't a life threatening. You didn't even go to the hospital, right? It was just no. all, all at home. No. Yes, I was at home. Home. You know, Jen, Jen uh, Packy, uh, the press secretary for Biden, she got COVID this w past week, too, you know. Uh -huh. and so yeah. you're in really good company. A lot of Austin, w Austin women who are vaccinated are getting COVID. And it's, uh, but. <laughs> the vaccination. Uh, sweetie is everything and you know what i'm i would have landed in the hospital for sure frank i didn't i didn't say anything i was really sick actually i actually thought about going to the hospital but my doctor mr frank cardello everyone if you ever yeah. want to know he called me up and he said you know irene he said you would have definitely you might have even like the 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 vaccination saved your ass. And I really believe it did. I think I would have gotten really sick because the reason I got double vaccinated in the first place is because I have, uh, I'm, I have that immune, uh, I have Epstein bar and I have asthma. So I was very concerned. So yeah, I'm living proof that it does work. Now, the thing that's interesting is that if you do have the ling lingering side effects, which I did have from COVID is that COVID brain, I guess, like I couldn't remember uh -huh. anything. Um, or short term memory, somebody I talked to a few people that said that if you do have that, they got the booster and it diminished immediately, like within a couple of days. Mm. So that's kind of cool. So I, I'm thinking about even though I have the antibodies, I was going to wait, but I think I'm going to get the uh, the booster shot. Oh, too. Sure. Now, now, do you have um, any idea uh, where you got the COVID? Or, or oh, I have a huge idea. Would you like to hear the story? Yes, so I here's what happened. Steve uh, went uh, to visit some friends. Uh, he, he went to visit his friend who's like disabled in a nursing home. And uh, Steve's double vaccinated. And he went with, uh, I think, three other guys. Uh, three out of the four were v double vaccinated. But that one guy that wasn't vaccinated actually um, got, uh, had COVID and uh, gave it to the rest of the guys. And then they gave it to their families, you know? So oh, that's well, how Steve happened. had COVID too then. Steve had COVID too, yep. He was really sick too. But again, not 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 sick like you're gonna end up, you know, like in a hospital or right. you know, it's gonna be like a near death experience, you know. But yeah, he was sick. So mm -hmm. anyway, so that's that's that was my big secret that I, I kept from it felt wrong that I kept that from you, Frank, by the oh, way. Oh, I think you have your right. right. To right to your privacy you know and it's up to you what you want to reveal to people yeah i just you know what I, I also didn't want to come out and say it at that time i think there's because people are just looking for a, a reason not to get double vaccinated at this point and yeah. uh you know the reality is that there isn't any vac vaccination that's 100 percent foolproof like even if you get the flu shot there's always a chance you could get the flu right right you know, so, um, but it saves you from getting really sick from the flu. Exactly. Exactly. You know, it, it's so overwhelming that's evidence that the vaccinations work. People are being dumb about it. And that's why I think Biden has to ramp it up even with even more mandates and requirements that, that people, um, I think he should do travel restrictions like immediately, like you can't get on a plane unless you've been vaccinated. Um, right. I don't think he's doing enough in that, in that area, you know, it has to be really hard ass about it. Because as much as like the police complain that, that uh, there were going to be like thousands of walkouts, um, it turned out 34 cops 
uh, had pay, had sick leave because they didn't want to get vaccinated, you know, and they said they were going to be right. Of them. Oh, it was only 34. Yeah, it's not, yeah. the case, not the case with the fire department, though. Did they I have think a lot of I think much more. I don't know what the, the numbers are. Do you have any idea? But I don't I think a lot of the fire department walked out. I don't think it's the same case with the fire department, but only 34. I'm glad to hear that. I really am. That's like a small and tiny number. You, that's, yeah, that's, that's, like it? About the, that's about the size of the cast of Hill Street Blues. You know, it's not a big deal. <laughs> oh, my God. I was expecting something much bigger than that. And my other secret that I've been holding back from you is that um, I'm a JFK Jr. in disguise. I know, Frank, it's, it's a lot to take in. I want you to just, you know, take it in. I mean, what the hell is going on with that now? I mean, these that people whole are- rally where people like hundreds of people at Dealey Plaza um, uh, in, in Dallas were waiting for the comeback of JFK Jr. First of all, why would he come back at Dealey Plaza where his dad was killed, you know? Yeah, he's got, those are triggers for him, no pun yeah, intended. Like, it's a makes, trigger makes, for him, no pun. Yeah, it makes no sense that he'd come back yeah. there. Um, yeah. And, uh, but you know, between JFK Jr. Uh, coming back from the dead and being part of QAnon and RFK Jr. being a deranged anti vaxxer, I mean, the Kennedy um, legacy is not really in good shape these days. Yep, it's not in good shape at all. And uh, even my if favorite, my, yeah. my favorite uh, onion headline recently was, uh, Kennedy curse taking its sweet time with RFK Jr. <laughs> <laughs> which I which I Oh my uh, god, that is so funny. Oh, I hate the person that came up with that. That yeah. is fucking hilarious. And anyway, if he did come back in zombie form, what makes what what makes these people think he's going to run with Trump in 2024? These people are blazing with fucking schizophrenia. That is what scares me, okay? Yeah, like there, there's, there's, there's mental illness going on in, in these some of these people, you know. In some of these people, I honestly believe that anybody that buys into this, and I've had, I, I hate to say it, I'm not going to mention any names, but some people that that are comics actually bought into that whole drinking the blood of Hollywood. I mean, if you're going to buy into that conspiracy theory, I think that you there's something wrong with you. You're delusional. Well, except that whoever these comics are who are buying into these conspiracy theories and crazy ideas, um, they're going to have podcasts that are much more successful than ours. <laughs> That's what's selling. And Jim, yeah. like Joe Rogan, you know, has like the biggest podcast in the world. I mean, and and he and my friend, he's my friend. I haven't seen him in a while, but Jimmy Dore, I used to be on his show. Mm -hmm. um, he's gone over into that deep end kind of thing. He Sorry, does too. Jimmy, Jimmy, I love you, but he's yeah. he's gone over into that deep end, and he just bought a house in Hollywood for like. Uh, on just under $2 million. I mean, he's so successful with that shit, you know? So, Frank, what does that say? It, it scares me because I, I think about this shit all the time. Like, you know, it, it's weird because we live in a bubble here in New York City. We fucking do. Even with stand-up, when you go out and you do sets, we're in a goddamn bubble here. Is the rest of the world really, like, do they really think like that? Um, that I think not, what is it? That, how are these... How is Joe Rogan making a hundred million dollars on a podcast well yeah he just has a uh, a huge following and people people like to believe um you know for some reason they'd rather believe that taking um horse dewormer is a better idea than getting vaccinated and uh, i i really don't understand it but i i what i do know is that the media the mainstream media is very complicit in spreading disinformation. Yes. Uh, a, a big example is the Virginia election where mm -hmm. the Republicans made a huge issue about critical race theory being taught in schools, which the mainstream mm -hmm. media reported on. And very rarely did they mention that critical race theory is not taught in schools. It literally isn't taught in schools. It isn't being taught in any school 
It's a whole issue they made up. They invented it. It's a lie. And, you know, places like not just Fox News, but CNN and Politico uh, and even the New York Times, they just kind of report the story without giving you the context that it's a fucking lie. And without the context, you don't have a fucking, you have bullshit. Context yeah, is yeah. everything. Mm -hmm. so, so, Frank, I always love that you say that because I think that people are still under uh, this, uh, this uh, false reality that like CNN and MSNBC and, and even the New York Times are like credible publications. Like where, what, what kind of, what source of, of news do you adhere to? Do you feel like is like the most... Um, pristine, where you're well, going to get um, actual information. What I do is I follow a lot of um, d d d different journalists that I like online on Twitter. I go to their feeds every day and then, you know, and then I they'll have, name a few, name a few oh, so that okay. people know. I'll tell you exactly who, uh -huh. um, uh, Eric Bowler. Um, you do that, yeah. I can, okay, he, Eric Bowler. He, I, I go to him. Um, Amanda Marcotte, I think is. I know you love her. Yeah, she's great. She's a she's a regular on John's show, as is yeah. uh, Eric Bowler, and um, uh, Soledad O'Brien. I'm a huge fan of. Yeah, and she, she's so good that she's not on CNN anymore. That's how fucking good she is. And right, exactly. She's not um, allowed in uh, in corporate media anymore, but she has her own media companies that are crushing it. You know. Really, so, that's great. So she's, she's inspiring. Um, Parker Malloy, who's a, who's a trans writer, is really mm -hmm. good. Or she's a writer who's trans, I should say. She's right. a really good journalist, happens to be trans. And I'm, uh, I'm following a few of these people as you as you speak. Parker yeah, Malloy. Huh? Okay. Yep, I followed them. I'm following them as you as you're talking. Oh, so there, that's there, great. And there's also like um, there's a hilarious guy. I think he works at the Daily Show, named Matt Negrin, who um, who publishes really great videos about how screwed up mainstream media is, and um, uh, he's really awesome. And um, uh, oh, Josh Marshall, Talking Points Memo. I follow him. I, I follow um, uh, Molly Jong uh, Fast, who who's really good, and um, um, I'm probably forgetting a couple that are really good. But uh, you know, but, but no, you've named a few, and that's really yeah. great. You know, because again. I think that people believe that there's like, like, for example, I, I know so many people that believe that CNN is so great. And I always love the fact that you're calling out CNN. And yeah, that CNN it's not CNN, is, it's MSNBC. You know what CNN and New York and the New York Times, like they have great people within their organization. They have investigative journalists. Uh, the New York Times has, sometimes they run great investigative pieces, but the culture at the times, their opinion pages, and um, and their and and their um, and they slant everything in the Republicans' direction. Everybody thinks the New York Times is this liberal paper. It's bullshit. They slant all their coverage in favor of Republicans, and uh -huh. uh, it bugs me. And that's and that's terrible. What about I listen? I have the app for NPR and I listen to NPR. What do you think about NPR? Um, I, I haven't. You know, I used to listen to NPR all the time when I lived in L.A. because I was driving all the time. So I was a very devoted listener, but I don't really keep up with them now. Mm -hmm. I, I've um, I've I've heard some things that they've had some reporting that's been a little below par where they mm -hmm. both sides things. But I, I don't I don't really follow them enough. Um, to uh, um, to give a real opinion on, on to give a real opinion. They yeah. they were your driving. I know they're great when you're driving. Thank God you're not driving, Frank. That's all I have to say. Like <laughs> literally for everyone else on the road. I'm just kidding, Frank. I don't even know how you drive. I have no idea how you drive. You can't my, my my driver's license expired, so I need to take the test all over again. Um, if I ever get around to that. 
I, I don't need a car in New York, so I haven't. And I don't know. Now that I'm 65, I'm wondering, should I even drive again? Am I too old now? Oh, fuck that, Frank. Of course you should drive again. Maybe you should you should freaking get your driver's license. I'll take you to the DMV. Let's do this. Of course okay. you should drive. Then you can visit me on Staten Island. I'll pay for the toll. <laughs> That's, yeah. I mean, you're young. 65 is not, like, old. No, I don't it's feel old. old. Uh, yeah. You know. But uh, I want, sometimes I wonder about uh, things. But, you know, I didn't learn how to drive till I was 40. I went most of my life without. I, I learned, I moved to L.A. when I was 40. And um, I from spent, Minnesota, right? From Minnesota? Yeah, from Minnesota. And I spent about a year in L.A. without knowing how to drive, which. In how did you Uber, manage? Oh, my God, the buses. In the pre-Uber era, it was difficult, you know. Yeah. Um, so then finally. I put my foot down and said, I got to learn to drive. So I finally got a driver's license. Um, and then I, uh, I bought a Toyota Corolla. I was going to ask. I love it. I love your choice of car. I'm sorry. I'm loving you right now for getting a Toyota Corolla. Uh, I love Toyota. They're, they're great cars. But then a few years later, when I was working on the Drew Carey show, I, uh, I stepped it up a bit. And I got a um, Toyota Solera, um, a red, a red convertible. Wow, midlife, existential. I love you. You're my hero. But that's my advice for anyone who does. You drive around with the top down, Frank. I need to know. Everywhere in LA, I, I drove with the top down. That's why I got it. And that's what I was about to say. My advice to anyone who lives in Southern California, you have to get a convertible because you go out and it's like a really nice day and you're just driving around and there's, you know, it's, it's, it's the, it was one of my favorite things about living in LA was driving around in a convertible. It's well, that's awesome. amazing. And you went at a, at a, a dashing 35 miles an hour in your red convertibles. <laughs> I, I, know know, but I, I, I was a pretty, um, uh, I don't know if I was that great a driver. And I, I when in my first few months of driving, um, like I would just be driving and I would have no idea what I did wrong, but I'd hear somebody from another, another car yell, learn to drive, asshole! You know, <laughs> with me not knowing what it was they were pissed off about. But it, it happened like uh, a few times. A few. <laughs> yeah. I can't, I honestly can't picture you driving, but I would absolutely love it. So, I mean, what happened to the red convertible? This is tragic. That's a gorgeous car. Uh, Did you end up selling of, um, it? When I moved from New York. I, um, I gave it, I, I, I let my friend use it. And then she, it, it kind of like, I don't know what happened to it. It kind of just disappeared off the face of the Wait, So you never sold it to her? You just gave it to her? Uh, yeah, yeah. I was just like, if she needed a car and I'm like, well, I'm not going to be using this one. Um, wow. See, you're such a good. And then, I, and, then she called, and then she called me and, and we were supposed to do something about it. And it was some DMV nightmare. And I just never pursued it, you know. So wait, so I love that you don't want to do the paperwork and you just gave her a beautiful red convertible. Your estate. By the time I gave it to her, though, I it had, I had been I had driven it around, and plus I drove it um, on a few pretty long trips. I drove it to Montana one time. Oh and my God, Frank! Let's talk. No, let's not move on from Montana. That's on my bucket list. You know, I really want to go to Montana. Oh, it's Montana beautiful. is awesome. Yeah, I love it there. Wow. Yeah. So, beautiful. what did you do? You stay? Did you stay there or just drive oh, through? No. Or I I um. Um, I, I, a friend of mine invited me there and, uh, um, oh yeah, it was her, her wedding. Uh, she got married in Missoula, uh, Montana. And, uh, my friend Holly, who's one of my, who, who were, who I worked with at the Drew Carey show and she lives in the Bay area now, but, um, uh, they got married in Montana, and I I, um, I drove to their wedding in my uh, car. And then by drove. yourself. This is amazing. I, I love it. You didn't have anybody. Did not, in my, not in my convertible, though, but in a rented car. This was years ago, 2003 or so, and I moved to New York um, 
to work at Air America Radio with Liz Winstead mm. uh, like 20, oh, almost 20 years ago. Wow. Uh, I, uh, I drove because I had my two cats. In that days, it was uh, Duke and Haley, my two cats. And I didn't, uh, and they were already elderly, so I didn't, was worried about taking one on a plane. So I literally drove them cross country from LA to New York when I moved what? back. Wait, what? Hold on. You drove cross country by yourself? Yeah, yeah. From LA to New York? From LA to New York, yeah. What the fuck, Frank? That's like insane. That's crazy. No, I, I don't think I ever look at, You know, and in fact, I... I wish I had more of those road trips in my life because I, I I loved it. Um, wow. And then um, by and yourself I, though you're saying you drove. That's yeah. I'm when sorry. I moved back from New York back to LA, um, like a couple of years later, because Air America was a big fucking disaster. But uh, uh, by then, unfortunately, Duke, my cat, had died here in New York. And um, and Haley was 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 left, so it was just me and Haley driving back to LA. Wow, I can't. Put, that's that's. I'm really impressed. I'm seriously really impressed. I mean, I was impressed with the the red convertible with the top down. That's a puss mag too. You probably got a lot of ass with that car. Tell the truth. But now you're telling me you drove on. I I I was a big avid road tripper, and I've never done that trip. I you never drove from LA to New York. Um, yeah, well, I, I, you know, that's why I should probably get a license again, because I'd love to do that again. And in you fact, should I have, do it. I have, let's, I, have let's a gig. I have a gig in January in San Francisco. My preference would be to drive to it. But I, I since I don't have a license, I'm going to take a plane because in the world of COVID, I would rather drive everywhere than take planes places, you know. Uh, Frank, when in January is your gig? Uh, January 23rd, I believe it is. And it's a San Francisco sketch fest. Uh, I'm going to be doing a movie riffing show with the other guys from mystery science theater. Wow. That's amazing. Actually that, that's, um, is that like an annual thing? This, uh, yeah, they do it. Uh, they do it every year. That. Yeah. Uh, that's like a really big deal. That's great that you're in that festival. Oh, yeah, I've been in the sketch fest for several years. Uh, the people that run it are friends of mine. And um, uh, I've had some really, uh, really great, uh, fun time. I just like going to San Francisco. It's such a great city. I love it. I haven't been there in so long, but I know, I remember once Rachel, Rachel Drach actually is always, or has been in the sketch fest and oh, wanted sure me to go has. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great. That's so cool that you're going there. That's awesome. So, so that's going to be like a, yeah, a road trip. I wish, listen, I mean, let me check my calendar. I wouldn't mind doing it. I miss the road tripping. The only road well, trip that always, I did. You're always promising me. I know. I fucking know. Never I'm, happy. I'm a dick. I'm just getting caught up with your birthday dinner, and you're already 66. <laughs> All right, listen. I'm an asshole. I know I am. It's a good no, thing you're I not. Have kids. You're not. No, imagine if I had kids, Frank. I mean, I did this even with um, poor Rachel's kid, Eli. He would always ask me, he would say, um, Irene, could you just check this one episode of like, it was like some show and I would be like, absolutely. And then he'd be like, so, and I'd be like, mm, haven't had the chance, sweetie, sorry. <laughs> you know, so it's just like a, a real asshole move. But, um, but I, I know, and I, I just like, you know what, I'm biting off more than I can chew. I really want to do it though. I really do because I used to road trip all the time from Wisconsin to New York. Wow. I've done. I've, done I've been on the road in Wisconsin quite a bit myself because I used to do when I lived in Minneapolis. We used to I do one nighter. Used to do one nighter gigs in um, uh, like uh, Appleton and. Uh, oh my God, Appleton! Stop! No one even knows where Appleton is except for yeah, me still and you. Uh, I think Somerset, Wisconsin, right at the border, and uh, several other. Uh, um, gigs. I love Wisconsin, by the way. It's a beautiful. I city. love Wisconsin, Frank. I love Wisconsin. You know, I I went to school at the University of Superior. There's nothing superior about it. I always have to preface that, just because I just wanted to get away from my family. I never finished any. But anyway, the point being, I I was right there. I was right near Duluth, so we would often go to uh, to Minneapolis all the time. You know. 
Yeah, well, Minneapolis is a, is a great, uh, uh, great, and also you know, Cinematic Titanic, the Mystery Science Theater show I toured with. We 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 did Milwaukee often. You know, we were there once or twice a year when we were together. So that. Oh was- yeah, I mean, I'm sure you you killed there. You know, I I just love it there. Plus, it's so pretty there. It is. It's really. Of, and I've been around the Midwest a lot because, like I said, I did a lot of, I did one nighters in North Dakota, in Iowa, Nebraska. Uh, if you did a gig in Iowa, you'd say, "Oh, you're from Nebraska." Well, we'll talk real slow for you. If you did a gig in Nebraska, <laughs> you'd say, "Oh, you're from Iowa." Well, we'll talk real slow for you. But, uh, <laughs> um, but I, you know, in a lot of that um, Midwestern, like North Dakota, like the scenery it can be actually quite soul crushing because it's nothing, it's flat and there's nothing to look at for miles. Nothing, desolate. And I used to do the drive from Minneapolis to like Bismarck, uh, yeah. which is a long drive and there's no scenery the whole time. But once you get into Wisconsin and parts yeah. of South Dakota too, there's really beautiful scenery around and Minnesota, of course. And Minnesota, yeah, no, you're right. It is soul crushing. Those flatlands with those big fucking windmills, and not even windmills. Those uh, those things that look like cows. I don't even know what they are. The towers, right? Yes, yeah. it, it can be. But then I was stoned the whole and time. The silos, you know, for the um, uh, you know, for the grain or whatever. <laughs> Wait, what is that called? I never knew what that was called. What is it called? A grain silo or something? I don't a know. A grain silo? I don't know what they are. But anyway, it was soul crushing. I like that you said that. But I was always smoking pot when we were on these drives. No, I, I, was so, I was sober by the time I did those gigs, unfortunately. But I loved it. I mean, I love the Midwest so much, and I missed it so much. I miss the people in the Midwest like yeah, crazy. The, the Midwestern people are, are great. And, I, you know, I, I grew up in New York. Um, I never had any, I, the only thing I knew about Minneapolis was the Mary Tyler Moore show. That was it. That was all I knew about Minneapolis. And, uh, and I never thought I would end up there. And then when my family did an intervention on me, they sent me to treatment there. That's how I ended up there. Wait, and, so your family did an intervention on you? What did they, yeah. like, I, uh, what they just, um, what, what was that like? Because I have a friend that just recently did an, a family intervention. Um, uh, and I want to know what yours was like. I'm so sorry. I don't know how to t- uh, turn this freaking dinging down. I'm afraid I'm going to turn off the sound. Um, okay. Worry. Um. It. it um, well, because I, you know, as you know, I had a drug problem. I had an alcohol yeah. problem. Yeah. Yeah. So they. Um, but like, who was part of the intervention? Your brother, your sister. My brother, all of my brothers and my sister and uh, my mom, and oh. and then like a uh, you know a facilitator lady who worked at some organization and you know so they very compassionately said frank you have a problem get the fuck out of town <laughs> leave now we're fucking sick of your shit so wow, get, frank, this is, it, get out I, of I, town I, and they and they actually had i'm not making this up they had the plane ticket at the intervention so i couldn't even go home uh I went straight from the intervention with my brother Rex, God rest his soul. God rest his soul. He accompanied me to Minnesota um, on the plane, you know, just in case I was going to drink on the plane, which I didn't. Um, and then he dropped me off there and then he turned around and he went back. Oh my God, he did that for you. What? I mean, yeah. that's a loving brother, you know? It he, really is. People he absolutely, just because- absolutely was. He was great. To do that, I, I love the fact that they thought you couldn't even refrain from drinking on the fucking plane. I, you know what? That's so- a very common thing, yeah. I think, what they think with, with yeah. alcoholics. And, right. and, but you know what? In my, my psychology, though, was that um, I had no intention to drink on the plane because I knew I was ending up in treatment. And my thinking was, I don't want to start drinking because I know I'm going to have to stop drinking, you know, right, that, right. that made it unappealing to me. The fact right. that I would have to get to a point where then I couldn't have any more. If I thought 
we were just going to get to Minnesota and I could keep drinking, I probably would have drank on the plane. Well, it's so, you know, what's so weird, Frank, I, I, you're just such a, I just, I've only known you sober. It's really hard for me. And we talk about this a lot. This obviously I know that you have a drinking and, and you were, you're a recovering alcoholic and you, you're, um, and, and you had a drug problem. But for me, it's like, you had a plane ticket ushering you out of town. I need to know how bad was Frank Conniff? What the fuck? would warrant you having a ticket at the intervention. Like what crazy shit did you do that the family was like, no. Any cra- I didn't do any crazy shit, I swear. You know, I was just, yeah. I was just not functioning. And, and they were all worried that I was gonna die or something. Right, okay, so that's what it was. They were that's, just yeah, worried. Yeah, that's what it was. It wasn't because I don't, I don't have any crazy stories about my drinking and drugging days. It's, it's yeah. so uninteresting. It's so boring. Um, right. I just got loaded until I passed out. That's right. all. There's no, you know, people in, uh, in, I've heard in 12 step meetings, they talk, Oh, I was, uh, they fired Uzis at me when I was trying to cop drugs. And then I had a high speed chase when, you know, none of that shit happened. None happened that for you. Me, you know, so, so when you went to recovery, like when you got that ticket, I love that your family did that for you. It's so sweet. And then they, they, they gave you the ticket and you went to recovery. Like, what was that like for you? Was it like so hard for you to continue? Like how long were you in recovery? I was, um, um, I got to this place called Twin Town in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, I love St. Paul. Yes. Uh, St. Paul is great. And, um, you know what? It's really a, a weird thing. Like from the moment I got there, like I was just in, I was just into it. I was like, okay, I know my life is all fucked up. I'm not achieving anything that I want to with my life. And now uh, here I am in rehab and, uh, and I'm ready to just do this, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, uh you know, and, and then I was just, I, I just never took another drink or drug again. And I, and I, wow, listened that's, what, I mean, I listened to what they told me um, in the re and I loved rehab. I loved the community of it. I loved the friendship of it. Um, mm-hmm. I had a re I had a really great counselor there. Um, and, uh, um, and I was there for a month and, and, you know, the thing is, is, if they didn't make me leave, I just would have stayed there forever. It was so safe and comfortable and structured. And uh, so I went from there to a, um, after a month, I went to a halfway house. Halfway house, I was gonna say a halfway called, house, yeah. Called Progress Valley in Minneapolis. And that was all all dudes, you know. Um, and uh, and that, that, you know, when I first got there, I was like, I just wanna be back in the treatment place um but that was uh you know that turned out to be really good too and that also had a really good sense of community to it um just about everyone there relapsed the minute they got out but right uh, yeah except for you but i yeah i was like one of the few who, who uh right. it seems who, weird when you hear the word halfway house i was going to say you went to a halfway house i feel like they need a, a more set i know something a little more colorful or uh, halfway house sounds so rigid you know what i mean yeah but, and it, it sounds like too like something you go to after prison or something yeah after prison exactly like yeah. now you're in prison. Mm-hmm. but what was that like so so did you continue to get like um the um the counseling. Um... Yeah, well, I, I, I was in there for uh, for three months, and um, yeah, and when you were there, part of the deal was you had to go get a job while you were there. You know, oh. so I went to this um, place in Minneapolis. I don't know if it's still there. Dolphin Temp, the Dolphin Temp Agency, and um, they had like a ton of loser jobs. <laughs> They could give to people every day. So I got like these temp jobs, like working in factories and stuff. And, you know. I can't. I can't. You're blowing my mind right now, Mr. Connick. What? You're blowing my mind. I'm picturing Laverne and Shirley. I I can't. I can't wrap my head around this. Wait. um, No, but the best job that I had there was um, the racing park in Minnesota. 
Canterbury Downs, it's called. And the the best job I had there, and I'm not making this up, was was going to Canterbury Downs and shoveling horse shit um, in the barns because it was outdoors. It was nice, you know. Mm-hmm. It was um, it was different from being inside those factories and stuff. Like I like that much better. But what ended up happening was I did get a regular job. Um, that wasn't temp, uh, not to brag, but then I got hired at Arby's. Okay, then you got hired of, of mystery meat. That's what we call it. Those sandwiches were so damn good. I'm going to tell you, wait, so you were shoveling dung in the farm, and then you went to shoveling dung in the fucking writing room. Yeah, sweetie. well, writing dung that people would eat um, at Arby's. Um, and, then I, and, then, and then what happened was... Um, so at this point, wait, I have a question. At this point in time, you weren't, you were, were you doing comedy at this point in time or not? Not yet. I, I started like when I got out of the halfway house um, okay. and I was working at Arby's, the morning shifts, by the way, like 6 a.m. till 11. Um, dedicated, dedicated. So my, my sleeping schedule in those days was uh, three to six in the afternoon and three to six in the middle of the night, you know? Because I had wow. to get up to go to Arby's, but um, uh, I started doing comedy. There was a place in Minneapolis called the Ha Ha Club um, that was non-alcoholic. It was a cabaret place. It's a comedy club. And non-alcoholic is that what you just said? Yeah, they didn't serve wow. they didn't serve uh, liquor there, so it's like kind of a perfect place for me to for go. You. And I went there for like a, a couple of months. And it was fun, but there was the big club in town was called the Comedy Gallery. And that's where like all the headliners like Seinfeld and Leno and, and Roseanne Barr all came in and played and they had an open mic there. And um, I, uh, I was hesitant to go there because they served alcohol. And, um, but then I remember it, I, I was at like a, a party of other 12 step people, all really nice people but I was so fucking bored out of my mind that I said, I've got to find other people that are, have similar interests to me in show business. You know, like I have to find people I can talk to the three stooges about, you know? Yeah. Right. <laughs> and uh, so then I, I went to um, like the Monday night open mic at the comedy gallery and, and the, and the other comics there, um, uh, they were, they were really nice. And they were, I remember I met like this guy, Paul Dillery there that first night there, he ended up becoming like a lifelong friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, and it was just very welcome, welcoming. It was, and it was, it was like, um, you know, my higher power (laughs) telling me that it was okay to be there, you know? Um, and then, and then not long after that, uh, Liz Winstead, who was already a headliner, in mm-hmm. Minneapolis, she came to an open mic the week she was headlining, and it was the first time I'd met her. This was like 1986, um, and she said, uh, "Oh, you're really funny. Do you want to MC my show this weekend?" Um, and so uh, that was like my first real gig ever. That wasn't an open mic. Was 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 being the MC in Liz's show, and then. Um, there was this guy, Scott Hansen, who unfortunately uh, uh, just recently passed away. Mm-hmm. Um, he was like the comedy czar in Minneapolis and he ran the comedy gallery and he could be kind of a gruff person to be around, but he did take a liking to me. Um, and, uh, and so like from that first night when I, uh, when I opened for Liz Winstead, like then I was at the comedy gallery every night after that for years, like tearing tickets, seating people, emceeing shows. And that's how I learned how to do comedy, you know? Well, that's amazing. You know, it's so important. Like I don't like emceeing now. I hate it, despise it. But the truth of the matter is when I started doing comedy, that's all I did was MC. I think it's so important to start out, but it's amazing. It's almost like, it's, it's great training to be a beginner comic and have to open a show, you know, mm-hmm. and um, and it's like the most difficult spot in the show. And that's why it's very good for you to do it. 
Absolutely. I always say the MC is it's easier to headline than it is to MC. I really think so because you yeah. not only have to be funny and have great jokes, but you simultaneously have to connect to the audience. Frank, I'm like, I'm really, this has like been the most interesting. I didn't never got like the, the seriously fuck our guests. I need to know <laughs> what's going on with you. This is like amazing. And we haven't even gotten into we're, we're, we're out of time, but I still have questions like, how like it seems like you know i mean you really had a prolific career writing and still do you know you do so much and it sounds like you just started from like ground zero on this you probably what ended up like working for um kate later on in life is that what happened like after okay. mc well yeah after i mc and then i eventually middled and uh you know how did you end up I... writing though oh yeah the writing well that that was something I always wanted to do, but the way I broke into TV writing was based purely on luck, just the luckiest thing that could right. have possibly happened to me to be living in Minneapolis. And for them, for people who I knew, uh, like Joel Hodgson and Mike Nelson and Trace Beaulieu, um, mm -hmm. people who were friends of mine already, who were okay. making a TV show in Minneapolis called Mystery Science Theater 3000 wow. that they sold to the Comedy Channel. And then I was able to get a job there. Just, um, they just fucking hired me, you know, a job. They hired you as what? Just like immediately hired you to be on or right? Was it well, like some sort of- uh, my, my, my friend Jay Elvis Weinstein was already uh -huh. um, on it, but he, he, after one season, he left. And so they had an opening. And, um, and Mike Nelson uh, just called me up. I remember I was in, uh, I remember exactly where I was. I was in a uh, hotel in, um, I was at the West, the Westward Ho Hotel in uh, Grand Forks, North Dakota. Sounds like and, a jizz factory. I like it. Yes. And, uh, and he called me on the phone in the hotel room and he, and he said, Frank, there's an opening on Mystery Science Theater. We got picked up for another season. Do you... And, and, and that's how I got the job. So the, the, the whole way I broke into the whole profession of writing for TV was the start of it was just luck, just pure serendipity. And, um, you know, that's, a, that's unbelievable. And and I'm, that still never making, I'm still making my living from it. That's how I make my living to this day is from oh, that, wait, you know, oh. I mean, and you know what, we're going to, we're going to wrap this up in a nice bow. I'm going to say that all of this was possible from that one plane ticket ushering you out of fucking town. Oh, absolutely. Sobriety made it all possible. You know? Made it all possible. If I could have, if I hadn't, I could have, if I hadn't been so fucked up, like I could have been a success in New York stand-up comedy, you know, but I didn't have this, my shit together, you know. Um, right. I could have risen in that world and had a whole different trajectory, but I think I would have been fine, you know, but I, I just... Uh, uh, and that's why it's great now to be friends with New York comedians that I would have met all that time ago, you know. Right, yeah. right. It's so yeah. crazy. Wow, that's amazing. Anyway, thanks for sharing, Frankie boy. That was like incredible. We, we told some secrets. We got the inside scoop on Mr. Frank. And it doesn't happen. This, this landing from this, this amazing luck that happened. It just, it's, 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 it's like, this really is like a miracle. You know, like you said, yeah. serendipitous that this happened. But anyway, thank God, because there's only one TV Sprite, sweetie. So whatever. OK, <laughs> it was supposed to be yours the whole time. Anyway. Um, OK, so we're out of time. Uh, next week, we have a uh, uh, comedian, Karen Burgreen on the show, everybody. Going to mm -hmm. be a great. Do you know her, Frank? I'm, I don't think I do know her. Well, you're going to love her. Trust me. You, go, you guys are going to love each other. All right. So do you want to plug anything before we go? Um, next Tuesday, uh, Tuesday, November 9th, 8 p.m. is the next show that Trace Blue, you and I are doing, a movie riffing show. Um, it's $10. Uh, go to Eventbrite, uh, type in the Mads, and we're riffing um, the classic of world cinema, uh, Voyage to the Planet of the Prehistoric Women. All right, I love it. Oh, no, I love it. Um, and uh, 
Follow me on Twitter, at Irene Bremis 13 All my shows are going to be posted. Actually, Laugh Boston, I'm taping another album. If you're in the area, January 9th, please stop by. It'd be very embarrassing if I'm taping the audience and taping an album to like four people, Frank, as you well know. It's very sad. Very sad. So, um, so Frank, I'm going to see you on Wednesday, and I'll see the rest of you on, uh, on next Tuesday. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in. Bye. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to the Mother May I podcast with Frank and Irene on Strong Island Entertainment. Check us out next week when Frank and Irene sit down with, you know what, I don't know what these two are going to do next, but we'll see you next week.